welcome students to my class on ba part 2 english literature we'll be continuing with paper 1 section a in the last class we had studied in detail thomas gray's elegy written in a country churchyard and in section a we have another poet from the 18th century england that is william blake and today we'll be studying the poem london by william blake William Blake another 18th century poet was born in London in the late 1700s that is 1794 and he lived in the 1800s when the ideals of society were restrictive and often overwhelming but Blake did not conform to these patterns but rather found himself among other radical thinkers so before studying the poem london students let us first have a look at the biographical history of william blake an 18th century poet born in london he was not only a poet but a very accomplished painter and a print maker uh, however he was not uh, much recognized during his lifetime but in the history of poetry and visual arts of the romantic age he became a very seminal figure his visual artistry led 21st century critic jonathan jones to claim him as a far and far and away the greatest artist britain has ever produced and also in 2002 william blake was placed at number 38 in the bbc's poll of the 100 greatest britons although blake was considered unconventional by his contemporaries because of his idiosyncratic views he is held in high regard by later critics for his expressiveness and creativity and for the philosophical and mystical undercurrents within his work as i told that he was also a good painter and his paintings and poetry both have been characterized as part of the romantic movement and as pre romantic because he was a precursor to the uh, poets like william wordsworth shelley and keats he was also a committed christian however he was at the same time hostile to the way the church of england behaved and to almost all forms of organized religion so in this blake was influenced by the ideals and ambitions of the french and the american revolution so in every age every writer or poet or an artist is influenced by the socio political economic issues of that era so blake was also influenced by his uh, socio political uh, background which was happening during the 18th century blake was basically a non conformist who had associated himself with some of the leading radical thinkers of his day such as thomas paine and mary wollstonecraft whose a vindication of the rights of women in 1792 Uh, opened the way for the feminists in the later era so these people uh, like blake they believed in free thinking and were not the kind to conform to society standards and the 18th century as we all know is the age of reason or enlightenment when uh, factual thinking was given more importance rather than free thinking so these poets and these writers they had departed from the society standards and uh, in this poem which we are going to study particularly blake condemns the strict and the stringent rules of society and he could write all that in such an emotive way because he had experienced some of this first hand at one point in his life he was accused of speaking against the king and the penalty for this was very severe and blake was very disturbed over the issue until he was finally acquitted so it's not surprising that he should revile such a strict government the words of this poem london condemn every kind of organized religion and government while it reveals the human heart's longing for freedom which will be the main subject for the poets to come that is wordsworth keats and shelley during the romantic age so
so the poem london was published in songs of experience in 1794 it is one of the few poems in songs of experience that does not have a corresponding poem in songs of innocence so actually songs of innocence and of experience is a collection of illustrated poems by william blake and uh, the term innocence and experience are basically definitions of consciousness that blake used from milton's existentialist mythic states of paradise and fall so while innocence is the stage uh, of a child and uh, experience is when you want grow so the experience brings in the fallen world and blake categorizes our modes of perception uh, which tend to coordinate with the chronology that would become standard in romanticism that is childhood a state of protected innocence rather than the original sin so uh, these were the two uh, collections of poems by blake and uh, in this particular poem blake who lived in london and so writes as a resident rather than a visitor and he describes the things he sees when he wanders through the streets of london which he perceives as signs of misery weakness which can be discerned in everyone's face so the critics have suggested that the poems illustrate the effects of modernity on people and nature through the discussion of dangerous industrial conditions uh, which at that time were child labor prostitution and poverty the poem london reveals blake's his feelings towards the society he was living in when industrialization had begun and uh, there were disruption in the way people used to live because in the 1800s england had become very oppressive being influenced by the french revolution and um, it had started to impose laws which restricted the freedom of individuals so uh, blake initially loved london and he wrote uh, in his poetical sketches golden london and her silver thames thames that is the river which was pure and shiny and clear tranche with shining spires and corded ships so this was his reflection of the london in this poetical sketches but after french revolution the british government began to oppose the civil democratic activities and rules had become very stringent for the residents and after that london had become quite different from before because everything was covered with the darkness terror and miseries on the common people so blake in his poem london shows this negative picture of his country and he offers a social criticism of 18th century england so let us begin with the poem and read stanza 1 i wander through each chartered street near where the chartered thames does flow and mark in every face i meet marks of weakness marks of woe so in this stanza you see that how the poet is using repetition and uh, alliteration as well as the use of the same word as a noun and a, and a verb so the repetition of the word chartered which emphasizes upon the darkness that is pervading england and the word mark has been used both as a noun and a verb so when he says mark in every face that means he perceives the faces of everybody he meets which are uh reflecting marks of weakness and of woe that is tiredness and uh pain is reflected in the faces which he sees as he wanders in the streets of so we find that blake in the first stanza provides through the speaker 
who can be thought of as Blake himself. The persona is the poet himself and he provides the setting and the tone. So the setting can be of course be derived from the title itself because it says London. So the, the setting itself is the place London. And the first stanza also reveals that the speaker is walking down the street. He says that he wanders down each chartered street. The term wander gives some reflection and insight into the speaker as well. He appears to be not quite sure of himself and a bit misguided if not entirely lost. So the use of the term chartered also suggests that the streets he walks are controlled and rigid. He is not walking in a free open field with greenery and uh, lushness but a confined rigid mapped out area. So the persona or the speaker will expound upon this idea later on in London, how it has become charted. And as he walks, he notices something about the faces of the people walking on the streets because there seems to be a reflection or marks of tiredness in them all, weariness. He describes their faces as having both weakness and pain. So this sets up the tone as melancholic. The gloom and the sadness seem to seep from the speaker's voice as he describes the passers-by. So, students note that Blake's use of the word chartered twice in this first stanza. Both the streets of London and even the natural geographical feature, the river Thames, which he describes as silver and shining in his earlier poetical sketches. Here he says they are charted. That means have been mapped out and demarcated by man. So the utilization of the term uh, with the alternate spelling that is chartered in William Blake's London carries with it the meaning of being confined within the city limits. With this word, uh, here we may note that Blake originally wrote dirty but uh, later changed it to chartered. And Blake suggests that Many human miseries are caused by the system and laws other men have imposed upon the poorest and most wretched in society. So this analysis of Blake's poem is borne out by his later use of the word ban in the next stanza where he says in every voice, in every ban. So a ban as you can understand is a, a public proclamation which declares uh, bound by law most commonly of course to declare that something is not permitted, is outlawed and therefore it is banned. So the role of uh, society or the laws or the system upon uh, human action and behavior. More restrictions means more manacles, if not physical ones, then certainly mental or mind forged ones, which Blake talks about in the next stanza. So now we come to stanza two. Let's read it aloud. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind forged manacles I hear. So now what's happening in this stanza is that Blake is now coming to how human beings are in misery and pain because of society's inhibitions. So students note that uh, while Blake in the first stanza sets up the tone of London, the second stanza gives some insight into the speaker's feelings which are sad because when he observes the people uh, who are passing by on the street, he feels that they are very melancholic. The speaker reveals that from the cry of the newborn infant who has not experienced any pain, uh, innocent child to the cry of the full grown man he hears the mind forged manacles so what are manacles so this gives insight into his despairing view of mankind and the word manacles are the shackles or some kind of a chain uh, that is the metal cuffs that are attached to people's legs or arms or necks in slavery which are called manacles so basically, it is anything, manacles is anything uh, 
uh, that restricts you, that inhibits you from moving physically, that keeps you restrained. So, but Blake uses the term, therefore, mind forged. So, these are not uh, physical iron uh, chains to stop you from doing anything, but they are the mental, mind forged manacles or chains which bind you and imprison you. So, the fact that these chains are mind forged reveals that they are metaphorical chains created by, the, by people's own ideas. So, in this stanza, the use of the word ban again reveals that these uh, bindings, these manacles or chains are placed there by society or human beings. As you know that a ban is a restriction given by law. So, the speaker use uh, speaker's use of the words such as chartered, ban and manacles. So, these words reveal his belief that society metaphorically imprisons people just like uh, physically chains are used to imprison slaves. Suddenly, it becomes apparent that the thoughts, pressures and ideals of society are under scrutiny here. So, the word forging in mind forged is of course the process of uh, when we see it in the uh, chains is the heating and hammering metals in order to wield them together. And if the manacles are mind forged, it means that we make them ourselves. So, these are our self-imposed limitations. The things that hold us back, the prison that we create in our own mind. So, in other words, Blake finds us entirely responsible for our own misery, pain and suffering. And uh, either way, these mind forged manacles are the restrictions that we uh, place ourselves on our behavior and views. So, we become slaves to ourselves and are governed by our own fears, doubts and other such inhibitions. So, uh, uh, it becomes apparent that Blake is focusing on the conditions of society in England during his time. So, let's now read stanza 3 aloud. How the chimney sweepers cry Every blackening church appalls and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. So, some other ideas have been now raised by Blake in this stanza which further uh, reflects about the gravity of the situation and the blackening of institutions because of their uh, pressure which is posed on the uh, people in England. So, in this uh, stanza 3 of London, the speaker or the persona digs even deeper into the reasons for his feelings toward humanity and he implies that the manacles or the shackles or the chains worn by the people and which are inflicted by society have such disastrous results. And he begins with the chimney sweeper. The chimney sweeper was one of the poorest of society. His life expectancy was also threatened because of his line of work. So, uh, he was cons consistently dirty and sick. Those children who used to go down the chimney to sweep and they were children because a small body could enter into the chimney to clean it. So, those of the lowest class, uh, they were forced into this kind of work in order to provide for their families. And then the persona criticizes the church, calling it blackening. Why was it blackening? So, the blackening of the chimney sweeper is actually a blackening of the church. It is pointing out towards the church and claiming that even the church appalls at the chimney sweeper. Often the chimney sweepers were just children, as I have mentioned. And uh, who were these children? They were orphaned and the church was responsible for them. So, this explains why the poet ties the chimney sweepers with the blackening church. And after this, uh, he, the speaker turns his attention uh, to the life of the hapless uh, soldiers. He has already criticized society, pointed out the misfortunes of the poor and the hypocrisy of the church. And now he will also criticize the government by suggesting that the soldiers are the poor victims of a corrupt 
government and he reveals his feelings towards war by describing the blood that runs down the palace walls the palace of course is where royalty would have lived thus the speaker accuses the higher up people in the society of spilling the blood of soldiers in order to keep their comfort of living in a palace so here we find that blake uh, is talking about uh, the jobs carried out by children in the early decades of the victorian era where it required children to do it because the work needed a smaller body and from just before the time of shakespeare it had been legal for churches to take on children and apprentice uh, them out if uh, the parents of the children were dead or they were poor then church authorities could take the children and put them to work so the aim was stop to stop them from uh, going into beggary and it was their responsibility to uh, take care of them so these chimney sweeper were the young malnourished children who were sent up the chimneys and uh, blake likes the chimney sweep image for its uh, black faced children who are so innocent beneath the dirt so the suit and the dirt is very much representative of mankind's mark on children because it is the church and the elders who are responsible for the uh, growth of the children so in line 2 of the third stanza uh, there are a couple of words which work in different ways to mean different things the first the first is blackening so the churches are literally responsible for blackening the children because it was their responsibility but they have sent them to the chimney and made them blacken so it works on a metaphorical level so churches should have been the places to purify people cleansing them not blackening them so it's deeply ironic that what the church is supposed to do on a metaphorical level is the opposite of what happens to the children on a practical level so the churches through this act have blackened themselves by the suit from industry and have literally become black and the word appals also means to horrify or to shock that when we say that something is appalling so the churches should be in a world where they function as they are intended they are disgusted and shocked by child labor not engaging in it themselves so but the but the churches are not shocked by the children uh, becoming blackened so it reflects that the pall or the blackening is the cover that they put in a uh, coffin making a link between what happens into the chimney sweeps and the church so this is how blake talks about uh, the horrifying act of child labor uh, which the church had encouraged so to reiterate uh, the third stanza of blake's poem london sees the two institutions which are associated with wealth and grandeur and uh, th that is the church and the palace they are uh, projected as being invaded by the corrupt realities of london during blake's time a world in which industrialization uh, led the small children of uh, being exploited and maltreated through their employment as chimney sweepers and in which uh, the word hapless which means unlucky the soldiers also were sent off to fight to spill their blood for the palace or the kings which were not bothered about their lives and to reiterate further the word pall reflects that the church has literally turned the color of pall or black because of the sooty breath of the chimney sweep but the palls are also as uh, explained are associated with the funerals summoning the premature deaths of so many children who died from injury or ill health while performing the job of a chimney sweep so uh, there is a uh, many meanings to the words used by uh, blake in his poetry which is uh, only of four stanzas but they are all very profound so now let's uh, come to stanza 4 which is the last stanza here the poet says but most through midnight streets i hear 
how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. So, the midnight, which again reflects the darkness, so the whole atmosphere is of a bleak environment and of darkness. So, he says that the point the speaker is making is that uh, in the midnight street, the sound which we hear is of the infants which are born into this world where young women have become prostitutes. That is the word harlot means prostitutes. And there, the tears of the children, instead of being soothed, they get cursed by these harlots. And the word blights in the sentence and blights with plagues the marriage hers so the same harlot curse which blasts the baby's tear or uh, shouts at it also blights with plagues the marriage hers which the speaker wants to reflect uh, through a semi oxymoronic phrase marriage hers uh, because uh, why it is an oxymoron? Because we associate marriage with children, life and union, while a hearse is obviously uh, used for a funeral or for death. So this is an example of oxymoron. So in this final stanza of Blake's London, uh, the speaker reveals how the corruptness of society attacks innocence of children and young women and he says that he hears the youthful harlot curse. So the idea of a youthful harlot suggests the level of poverty in society and corruption and that a girl who was yet a youth would be involved in prostitution and then things become even more interesting as the speaker reveals the object of harlot's cursing that is uh, the tears of a newborn baby who keeps crying. This is the ultimate attack upon innocence because the speaker does not reveal whether the harlot is the mother of the baby or not, but he does imply that rather than comforting a crying infant, she curses it. So this reveals the hardened heart of the harlot, which represents uh, metaphorically the hardened heart of society at large. So while the innocent child shed tears, the perverted attack. Last line of London poem reveals the speaker's thoughts on marriage as well because the harlot or the prostitute uh, apparently has blighted the marriage hers. So she has deranged marriage by having sold her body before even entering into the marriage union. So although the speaker believes that the harlot has somehow damaged marriage, he also reveals his beliefs about marriage in the first place. So the fact that he calls it a marriage hers reveals the, his views uh, on marriage as death. So overall the poem has criticized society, the church, prostitution and even marriage. The innocent baby shedding tears represents those who are innocent in the world. They are few and they are shouted at and they are also infants and are not left to be innocent for long. So their innocence is also blasted by the cry of the perverted. So what needs to be emphasized here from the point of view of uh, literary appreciation and the figures of speech is the final image uh, in the word marriage hers, which I have just explained is an oxymoron because hearses are not are for funerals and not for weddings. So it emphasizes upon uh, the uh, young unmarried mother's unwanted child and the misery of both the mother and infant alike, which has converted into a feeling which will come through a hearse. So it is the final nail in the coffin of the idea of marriage as a sacred union. So in uh, Blake's time, how this institution was also uh, blasted. A curse, of course, can be merely a loud cry and uh, it carries a ring of profanity at all times. So the final line is a master stroke. First, the near alliteration of the BL and PL Explosive sounds and blights and plagues. But then the oxymoron of marriage hers, with hers itself being a horrific constructing of harlot's curse, the line it rhymes with. So, before we end, uh, we need to also understand and focus upon the rhyme scheme and the meter of the poem. So, it is written uh, like Thomas uh, Gray's. LG written in a country churchyard in a regular iambic, but not pentameter, tetrameter. 
So I wandered through each chartered street. Blake uses this meter in a number of his poems, so it may be overanalyzing the poem to suggest that this choice of meter is of specific significance for London. Having said that, the iambic rhythm and the locking of the A B A B rhyme scheme does reinforce the poem's sense of relentlessness as Blake confronts the horrific prisons, real and psychological, that Londoners live their lives trapped within during the 18th century. That said, Blake does not stick to the iambic meter throughout. A number of lines, such as the last line of the first stanza, begin with strong, trochaic feet, and the third stanza is entirely trochaic. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. With this, we come to the end of our lesson on William Blake's explanation of the poem London. Thank you.